Welcome to the Bayside Message of the Week. If you have a story on how God is working in your life, send us an email to stories at baysidechurch.com.au. If you're in the Melbourne area, why not come join us at our Cheltenham or Frankston campus and see how church has changed? Check it out. Today, I am going to be talking about keeping calm and carrying on. And this actually is... Oh, 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 okay. This is actually something that's very big in our home. I carry cups of tea to Rob when he's doing his sermon preparation called Keep Calm and Carry On. And if he's feeling a little bit, you know, funky, I'll say, why don't you just keep calm and log on to Facebook? But in reality, um, the research says that logging on to Facebook actually makes you depressed, not calm. So don't log on to Facebook if you need to keep calm. Now, and then we've got reinforcements because I've um, got a little box here that you, uh, that you, you know, can keep all your keep calm thoughts in. And just in case we break a mug, keep calm, I've got another one. It's true. Uh, you know, there's a whole industry out there about keep calm. Let me just see what else I have in my bag. Oh, yes. Okay. So keep calm for moms. Keep calm. It's only another birthday. That's a really important one getting more and more important. But the option is that you don't have another birthday. So, you know, just keep calm. It's good. Then, um, in case I run out of supplies, I've got a 365-day calendar of keeping calm. Can you tell that I need a little bit of this? Oh, and, oh, this one's great. You know, last night, Joe Russell was here, and I said, keep calm and jog on. But since she's not here today, keep calm and eat more cake. Uh, that's a good one. Cake helps most things. Last night, Trinity chucked an absolute wobbly that I was going to church and she wasn't. And I thought trying to keep calm and preach while your six-year-old is running around the front would not be good. So she had to stay at home and I offered her to make cake and that made her happy. You see, making cake makes you calm. Keep calm and shop on. And for those that then get buyer's regret, you've got keep calm, I've kept the receipt. I put this onto Facebook, you know. My kids, they say that I've got to keep calm saying, thank you, keep calm, I've got Camille. Um, I've got a saying for everything. Every room in your house, you know, in the kitchen, she said, keep calm and load the dishwasher. There's another room that should say, keep calm and focus on the ball. What room would that be? Keep calm and hang up the tiles. Keep calm and click Edit is a good one. The other day when I was preparing this message, I'd done my research and then I was putting it all together on Wednesday. Wednesday was not a good day uh, for many reasons. No, seriously, it wasn't a good day. And but my first bad thing that happened was I pressed save as, as you do, saved the document and went ahead and lost it. But keep calm, I had a hard copy. I mean, what is the option to keeping calm and carrying on? It's, you know, no panic and freak out. I think we have one of those, yeah. Keep calm. Now I panic and freak out. But there's no point in panicking and freaking out because it doesn't look all that cool. When I um, asked some people on Facebook, you know, different things, all sorts of um, keep calm responses came up. The, this, this poster, this keep calm poster is actually a World War II poster. And there's a couple of others that I got for you to have a look at because I find them very interesting. Can we show those guys? There we go. Your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. My courage. No, it's, it's all of our courage together. I love that one. Then there's another one. There, this time we're all on the front line. Can we have the next one? Uh, careless talk costs lives. This is a fascinating one. This was actually done for World War II, but when I grew up in Northern Ireland because of the Troubles, this poster was massive everywhere. Careless talk costs lives. I think that would be a good one for us in the church to remember as well. Uh, then there is a food posters. Where do you see these ones? Where is it? Yes, food. Buy it with thought. Cook it with care. Use less wheat and meat. Buy local food. Serve just enough. Use what is left and don't waste it. That's good advice. Oldie but goodie. And then there's bunker posters. Now, these made me laugh. 
Um, this is the first one. Uh, he had his heart set on pate de foie gras. Navy Cho is the best. Take all you can eat. Eat all you can uh, take and don't be finicky. I tell you what, some people are so finicky. They're finicky about, their, about every single thing. It has to be just right. My dad, I have to you know, owe him $10 because I'm using him as an illustration. Three days after Christmas, he goes, please, please, no more ham. I'm like, dad, first world problem. <laughs> Don't be finicky. Okay, and then there's another one here, the next bunker poster. This made me laugh very much. How full is your bunker? Know your capacity and don't overload. And you can see the full half, quarter, whatever, whatever. Food is your fuel, don't waste it. <laughs> I thought that would be really good as a diet poster, actually. Keep calm and don't overfill. Anyway, those are just some fun posters. And I thought they were amazing because they were actually talking to um, everyone together as a corporate group. Um, with a cause, trying to keep people focused on the bigger picture. And I think, you know, there is a bigger picture that we need to be focused on as the people of God. Winston Churchill said, stand firm and carry on. In London, in May 24, he says, if invasion comes to Britain, Mr. Churchill's orders to the population are to stand firm and carry on. 14 million leaflets will be issued throughout the country next week entitled Beating the Invader. And we have got to learn to beat the invader of our souls. And the invader of our souls can, can come in all sorts of ways. But you know, today, Churchill's words echoes the text, which is, Exodus 14, uh, and Exodus 14, 14 and 15. Now, I keep calm. I've done some research. It's all good. But before I go there, um, I want to tell you a few things about Moses that just helps to put this uh, text in context a little bit. Moses was hidden for the first three years of life during the Egyptian genocide of the Hebrew firstborn. So he didn't have a great start to life. He was set adrift on the Nile as a last attempt to save him. That's pretty full on. When we read it, we read it as this little story about a little baby put in a basket and off he goes merrily down the stream. Not quite. This is a child put in a basket as a last ditch attempt. Can you imagine how his mother was feeling to have to do that to your child? He was adopted slash stolen by Pharaoh's daughter. She knew who the mother was, but she still kept the baby. He was raised in a palace with royal family while fellow Hebrews continued to be killed and enslaved. Again, we romanticize this. We think that this child was plucked out of an unfortunate situation and then in a palace, but in a palace while all your people are being mistreated. There are major consequences in your, in your psychological ability when you have to think about that. The fact that, that um, on contrary to the movie, I'm actually preaching from the text and not the movie, which is probably good. Um, people knew that he was a Hebrew. So here he is. And, and, you know, there was other slaves around and yet he was being treated differently. Imagine if you were a mother slave who'd lost your son and yet you're seeing this child, you'd be happy for this child, but you would also be thinking about the loss. It would be a constant reminder of the loss of your own child. Moses had a debilitating speech defect that made it nearly impossible for him to speak. Um, a lot of research has been done on that and, and basically his speech defect was because of the uh, crises he faced in his early childhood development. There are many stories about how he got that speech defect and it's probably worthwhile at some point looking those up. I would suggest that at some point you actually take some time and ponder what psychological effect his youth would have had on him. I mean, try, imagine trying to keep um, a three-year-old quiet and uh, hiding him for so long, then forcing him to be separated from his family. The stress of being a Hebrew within the dynamics of the royal family who believed that, human, that, that Hebrews were subhuman, like untouchables, the worst of the worst. They, they weren't even um, worthy 
of, they, they were not even seen as human beings. What effect did his being spared death and living in the palace have on the view of him by the others? We have to look, when we take this into context, at the circumstances of his, why he killed the Egyptian overseer and then why he fled his time with and learning from Jethro or, or Jethro as we call him. And he was a, a, a priest of a foreign religion and yet he sought solace and sometimes even advice. Uh, it was Jethro that said to him, you know, why don't you delegate? And Moses listened to him and was able to uh, get on with his work. I wonder how he must have felt when he went back to face Pharaoh and more importantly, his fellow Hebrews. Now, keep calm. I'm going to read the scripture. For the Lord will fight for you. This is Exodus chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. For the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The um, New Living uh, Testament says, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Another version says, you only have to be silent. Um, the ASB says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. The Lord will fight for you. You need only keep your peace. And the Holmans, which I love, says, the Lord will fight for you. You must be quiet. That's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for most of us, if we're honest. And if we're not quiet, if we're, not, if we're not talking like this, there's a lot of talking going on here, but it's talking about being still and being quiet. Then the Lord said to Moses, the next verse, verse 15, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on or tell the Israelite people to get moving. Tell the people of Israel, Israel to go forward. Tell the Israelites to break camp. Tell them to move out. They're getting the message, keep calm but keep moving, carry on, don't get stuck. You see, calmness is not just a state of mind. It's a dwelling place. It's a location. Ephesians 6 verse 10, if you have your Bibles there, you might want to look at this, but I'll read it to you anyway. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. In the power of the final world. You know, I might say to you, um, whoever's on lock up today, can you turn off this? Can you do this? And before you leave, turn on the alarm. What I'm saying is all these things are important, but the most important thing is turn on the alarm. I might say to the kids, do this, do this, hang out the washing, and then make sure you lock the door before you leave. It's the final word, the part of the final word that everybody wants to know what are the last words of someone before they die. There is power in the last word. The list in this that, that, that he's talking about before this last word is really important stuff. It's, the other instructions are important. It says, you know, it talks about relationship between believers, relationship between believers and the word world, relationship between husbands and wives, relationships between parents and children, employers and employees, all great stuff. But then he says, and finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, the devil was attacking the Ephesian church and was succeeding. They needed more than just theology. They needed more than practical instruction. They needed to learn to be in the Lord. It's exactly the same in the persecuted church. You know, you might be in a situation where theology is actually not going to help you if you are being held hostage. Somebody giving you a theology lesson is not going to help you. You might, um, somebody giving you practical advice, you know, may not even be possible in a situation like that. But you have the ability to locate yourself and find yourself in the Lord. Now, I hope and pray that none of you ever face any of those drastic situations, but we can be held hostage in other situations. We can be held hostage in sicknesses. We can be held hostages in debt. We can be held hostages in relationship, but we can live in Christ in those times. The word to in is in dunamis. It's an explosive word. It talks about strength, ability, and power. It is our word for dynamite. This is not just a wimpy little kind of 
thing, a little feeling, a little ah. No, no, no. This is powerful. The picture here is explosive power being placed inside some form of receptacle or container, some form of receiver for this power to be put into it. Now, listen, I have been banging on about this scripture for like three years because it is so important and it is getting even more important as we face the invasion of the world, the invasion of the end times, the invasion of other things that are taking our minds and hearts and resources away from the kingdom of God and into the kingdom of darkness, subtly, daily. So we must learn that we must be in Christ. You know, this is so cool. We are specifically designed by God to be receptacles of divine power. This flesh, little inadequate tent, God chose to be a receptacle. Your tent is a receptacle of divine supernatural power. Paul is saying, receive a supernatural strengthening, an internal deposit into your inner man, something that the world can't give and the world can't take away. It's inside. God is the giver and we are the receptacles. Ephesians 6.10 could actually read like this. Be infused with supernatural strength and ability. When you infuse something, it doesn't have to be this big, enormous thing. You know, I've got this oil, uh, olive oil. I've got olive oil infused with lemon, olive oil infused with chili, and olive oil infused with garlic. Now, the olive oil infused with lemon is actually not that strong. So, you know, I use it for a whole lot of different things. The other day I was run out of olive oil and I thought, I'm making chocolate muffins. I'll quickly use the olive oil infused with garlic. <laughs> After all, it's only a little bit of garlic. Not a good idea. You know, we, we think we need this massive thing going on all the time. But little can mean a lot. You know, we are told to be the salt on the earth. We're not told to be the whole salt shaker. Uh, too much salt is sickening. But a little salt is just right, but keep your salt top quality. You don't have to do the whole job. You just have to be the sprinkling. Sprinkle yourself. Don't unload an entire salt cellar. No wonder the Irish think that if you, you know, break a salt cellar, it's unlucky. Because a whole salt cellar is just too much. It just ruins things. Just a little sprinkle. Infusion, be infused with supernatural strength and ability. Be empowered by this special touch of God's strength. Receive his inner strengthening. Paul writes this in the locative tense, meaning that the power is locked up inside the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, Pastor Wyan was with me when I preached this first point in Karakabam prison and people are locked up inside. Now they're locked up for two reasons. They're locked up to protect others and they're locked up to protect themselves for doing something else again, that's more stupid than what they did before. Now, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of locking up. Because sometimes I can be the one that causes hurt and pain to other people. And other times I need to be locked up in Christ to be protected from the horrible things that people do to me. And if I am safe in that place, then nothing will touch me. You can't receive this power by reading books or listening to tapes. It's only through personal relationship. It's uncomplicated to be in Christ. Paul uses it to declare that we are perpetually and infinitely locked up inside the person of Jesus Christ. In verses three, it says that in this place, we have every spiritual blessing. We don't have to go looking for it. If we want to find it, it's in Christ. In Christ, we are chosen. That's where our specialness comes, not from this personal branding business that people go on about, you know, what's your brand and your identity and your ego. No, no, no. Our identity is in the fact that we are locked up in Christ. People should see Jesus when they look at us. Verse six says that we have all the grace that we need. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of grace. Like I said, one minute I can be the one healing, the next minute I can be the one hurting. And sometimes I don't know it and sometimes I do and I do it anyway. Anyone, in, anyone with me? Anyone say things and they do the things that they really don't want to do and then they go, ah! You know, I've started doing this thing over the last 
couple of years now where I sit down at night and I reflect, like, like I run like a movie the whole day and the conversations. And I recognize when God's presence fell and when it left. And now I'm at this point where I know if I have a specific conversation, I'll be repenting of that that night. So rather not have the conversation. But sometimes I just do it anyway. Ugh. And that's because I'm no different from Paul. I'm no different from you. You know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I do, I don't want to do. You know, all that. We're all human. And that's why we've got to allow grace to each other because we don't know which place we will be in. In Christ, we have redemption. In Christ, we have inclusion. And in Christ, we know the mystery of his will. You will not know the mystery of his will. You will not know his direction outside of him. It is not possible. He needs to become a realm of existence and the place that we dwell. You can have a physical address and a spiritual address. Let's face it, guys. We are in transit here. Some of us have a longer layover than others. I adore my mom and dad, but I know that they are in transit here. I know that, you know, you cannot live forever. People might live 90, 100, you know, even... And, and there will be natural pain and, and heartache when people leave from us, even though we know that they're going to a better place, if that's what we know. But it will happen. We are in transit. We have a spiritual location. We need to understand the culture of that kingdom where we're going. The Bible says, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are bringing our culture to earth when we act in a heavenly way instead of a hellish way, both to others and to ourselves. The word power here is dem demonstrative. It's eruptive. It's tangible. It's something that you can see. The word actually is kratos. If there was a crater in this auditorium right now, there would be no question about it. You would know that it was here. This is the kind of power that us Christians need to carry. We need to carry a power that is tangible, that is knowing. The word is might. Be strong in his power and his might. It means muscular ability. You could actually read this scripture like this. Be strong in the Lord and in the powerful, outwardly demonstrated ability that works in you as a result of God's great muscular ability that is working behind the scenes. You know, I like to think about this. I like to think about Jesus putting his shoulder up against my problems and pushing them and shifting them and moving them. His muscular ability is working on our behalf when we are in Christ. When we are strong, he, he doesn't care about our strength. It's our weakness. The Bible says it's in our weakness that his grace, his strength is made perfect. When you're feeling weak, you go, whoopee do. God's muscular strength is working for me today. He is shifting things that I couldn't even dream of shifting. You know, you have enough power in you to resist anything that comes against you when you locate yourself in Christ. You know, it's like this. Outside our um, front door, we have a pond. We did have 16 fish, but Murphy, our gorgeous dog, Rob thinks it was a bird. Keep it a secret because the bird is anonymous. Nobody cares about the bird, but I care about Murphy. Little, little Murphy. How come when you talk to dogs, you do a little Murphy, me, 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 me. How come you talk to dogs and children like that? That's, that probably must be a psychological issue that I do that, but everybody does it, so we all have psychological issues. Anyway, he's a she, she's a retriever. So she's designed to get things and bring them to me. Anyway, the problem is that a fish in water is swimming naturally and is very lovely. A fish out of water, when a fish comes out of water, you go, ah, 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 don't touch it, or move it, move it, move it, move it. Or I'm trying to grab it and throw it back in and hope that it's going to live or whatever. Now, let me tell you something. As Christians, when we are not in Christ, we're like flappy not happy. And when you're flappy, you know, nobody knows what to do with a flappy Christian and they're panicking. And you know, it's like, and it's like, you know, the other day Rob was flapping about the awning and I'm like, how do I get him back in the water? How do I get him in Christ again? And I'm going, and I thought, oh, well, I can't say you're flappy, not happy. 
And I thought, what, what do I do here? Anyway, I said, have you prayed, honey? You know, like a good godly wife. He said, nope. And I said, well, why don't you just pray and I'll make you a cup of tea and give you a mince pie. Because that also helps them get back into the water, you see? You've got to work out what helps people get back in the pond. You know, because you can't just say, you're not in Christ, clearly. You know, that's a little bit judgmental, don't you think, when somebody's going through a crisis? Especially, you know. So anyway, blow me down. We prayed. And the awning went out. And he said, what did you do? I, I said, I did nothing. I did nothing. You prayed. Anyway, we thought, oh, great. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, a little bit. Moment of pride. Moment, moment. And I thought, no, repent of this pride. And as well, I did. Because then the awning started to go in and out, in and out, and in and out, like something possessed. Then the two of us were flappy. <laughs> and then we pulled it out at the switch. And that solved all the problem. Flappy, clappy, happy problem. But isn't it true? You know, you find yourself <gasps> gasping. And where are you located? Because let me tell you something. There has never been a time where I've been sitting in the presence of God, allowing him to minister to me or reading the word of God. And I've been going, <gasps> no, 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 no. You are so far out of that pond. You are flappy. And when somebody's flappy, we need to help them get back in the pond again, gently. The second thing is be still. Stillness is quietness, no movement, not easy. Let me just put a thought out there for you. Moses has had years of stillness, quietness, unable to speak. He's at his point where God is going to use him to deliver, biggest moment of his life. And what does God tell him to do? Go back into his place of weakness, stillness, silent. He's just got the mastery, the victory over his speech. And now God says, no, 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 no. You be quiet. He's been told this all his life. And now at this moment before deliverance, God tells him, it looks like he's taken a step backwards. You know, we learn so much more from our pain than we do from our pleasure. We learn much more from letting go than holding on tight. God is saying, let go of this situation now and you will see my deliverance. Letting go of our security, our self-image, our good reputation, our self-made identity, it all has to be stripped off because you can't get into that bunker with Christ when you've got too much other clutter around you. You know, some of us need to have people think a certain way about us. We need to let that go. You can hear better when you're still. You know, it's amazing. When you're really quiet, you can hear your own heartbeat. You can hear the clock tick. In fact, you can hear the clock tick next door. A <laughs> first wave. There you go. When you're really still, you can hear what people are saying. Every conversation has content intent and emotion. When you really listen, what are they saying? I'm not feeling recognized. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling frustrated. What are they saying? Well, you'll only listen when you're still. Letting go means simplifying. Buy less, make more, live better is one of the wartime sayings. In an article that I've done for Bayside Life, it's uh, calm, oh, sorry, slow is the new black. Sometimes we just need to slow down before we move on. Contemplating and thinking by itself is navel-gazing. Action without thinking is addiction and activity. It has to go together. The biblical revelation to us is about awakening, not accomplishing. You cannot get there. You can only be there. But the foundational being in God for some reason is so difficult to believe and also so it sounds too good to be true for most people only the humble will usually believe it and receive it as it refer affirms more about God than it does about us proud people are not attracted to such explanations I love what Saint Bonadventure says about God by God's power presence and essence God is the one whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. God exists uncircumscribed in everything. 
This is Christianity's great message, which it has in large part been found too good to be true and too hard to believe. Now, just before I get on to my third point, I want you to keep calm. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. This is about moving out. The word here is a strong word. It's used once and it means to pluck out, to move forward with intention. I like this, especially at a new year. There's no better time to make a decision than to move forward. We need need to learn how to step over our wounds. That's not ignoring that they're there, but stepping over them, making a choice. There's a little story that Rob told one time about a donkey that this man tried to bury alive. And the donkey, every time the, 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 the soil came in, the donkey would just shake it off and step up. Another shovel of muck and dirt would come in and the donkey shook it up and stepped up and shook it off. Another another thing of muck and criticism and whatever it was and the donkey just shook it off and stepped up. Let me tell you, I am a really good donkey. (laughs) And then eventually the donkey is on eye level looking at the person that was trying to bury it because it just stepped up and shook it off. We need to step up and shake it off. Sometimes we have to step over our anger, our jealousy, our fear, our feelings of rejection, whatever it is, and just move on. The temptation to get stuck in our negative emotions, poking around in them as though we actually belong there, although that's our address. That's not our address as Christians. Our address is in Christ. Then we become the offended one, the forgotten one, the discarded one. That becomes our identity. That's not who we are in Christ. We can get attached to these. We can actually find lots of evidence to support it. But and we take morbid pleasure in them. It may be good to have a look at the dark feelings in your life and explore where they come from. But there comes a moment to Step over them, leave them behind and travel on. You know, there's certain things, certain words, certain situations that I, this year, I'm walking away from. I have literally just stepped out of the clothes and I'm walking on. And I'm feeling like I'm in this new blazer. And you know, if any moms here, you know, I buy my kids blazers and they come down to here, you know, because they will fit them by the time they're ready to leave school. You do know that, don't you? So it's like God saying this jacket that you're wearing, this outfit that you're wearing is a new one. It's a good one. It might feel a little bit big for you right now, but it's going to be okay. You'll grow into it. It's better growing into it than being, you know, strangled and suffocated by some of the old. And some people here today are strangling and suffocating by some of the old. You know what? This is a new year. You got to move out, move on, break camp, change your address to where you belong. You know, we don't know what lies ahead. You know, people talk about five year, 10 year plans, but the Bible doesn't. Sufficient unto the day. You know, if you just have enough light for the next step, the next step, the next step. The art of living is to enjoy what we see and not what, not complain about what remains in the dark. You know, like, like Dory in Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Stop the flapping, just keep swimming. Remember, if I'm flapping, I'm not in the water. You know, the night that I finished this, after I had lost all my work, keep calm, I'd kept, I'd kept a hard copy. 60% of it I was able to save. That night I got the phone call before it hit the press of um, Mayu Sukumaran, the, one of the Bali Nine who we are praying for and supporting, that his clemency appeal had been denied. You know, this is a fun message that I'm preaching, but there's serious stuff in it. I said, Mayu, how are you going? He said, I've got to be in hope. And he said, I've got to stand strong. I said, you know, that's what I'm preaching on this weekend. I'm preaching on Exodus 14, 14 and 15. He said, I love that scripture. And I said, will you hold on to that scripture? I said, you get into Psalm 91, you pray that scripture. And if someone who is facing that can say that, surely we can say that we can keep calm, be located in Christ and carry on. His mom said to me the same night, she said, you know, I am so blessed that I've had 10 years of seeing my son become the man I knew that one day he could be. She's a beautiful Christian. She needs our prayer. She needs our thought. 
You know, I know that I will need to gently and lovingly help these folk get into the water regularly. If you know someone around you that is out of the water and they're flapping, help them get into the water. You know, one of the things that, that we need to be aware of in this current day, we have got to stick together as Christians. We have got to keep our fires burning. You know, I know that there are times in our lives where we have to make choices for family or whatever. I get that. I understand that. And you will not get any judgment from me here. I promise you. But we miss you when you're not around. And I know that there are genuine reasons, but if you prioritize God out of your life and you live a lifestyle, that lifestyle becomes your God, then slowly but slowly you are getting out of the pond. We need you. We need us to be together. We need to walk together. We need to have people that will say, hey, listen, right now you're out of the water. You need to get in. And to do that in a loving and gracious way. I'd like to just pray for us before we finish this morning. So good to be together. It's so good to see all those smiling faces. I can actually see them. It's great. <laughs> How wonderful to be in the house of God. Don't take this for granted. To be able to worship together. Our worship has never been threatened in Australia. Let's keep pressing in. Let's keep praying and being mindful of the people whose worship is under threat. Christians in Syria, other parts of the world. Let's stand strong for people. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I just thank you for every person here. Lord, every person that needs your muscle to come into a situation and to move it supernaturally. Lord, for people who are weary fighting battles and being strong themselves, Lord, help them to understand that they only need be in you. They need to be locked up in you. Every one of us can be in that place. No matter what our physical ability is, no matter what our location is geographically, we can be in you. Father, help those of us who need to move on this year to move out, to break camp. Just with every eye closed and heads bowed, there's two things I'm going to ask of you. Firstly, I'm going to ask if there's something that has spoken to you this morning um, from the message. And don't worry, you don't have to keep calm. You don't have to please the preacher. But if there's something that has spoken to you, could you just raise your hand? Because I want that to heaven to see so that... Um, just keep your hand there one moment. Lord, you see every hand... Father, you know what every heart is dealing with. Oh, Holy Spirit, in your great power, the dynamic power that you have and you alone, we ask you, Lord God, we release to you our burdens. Cast your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. He loves you. He loves you. And every thing that he does for you is because he loves you. Thank you. Thank you for raising your hands. Lord, I just seal them in you. If there's anyone here today and you feel that you need to get your 2015 set straight and you want prayer, uh, we'll make people available to you at the end of the service. If that's you, please don't leave here today without getting someone to pray for you. It doesn't matter how brief. It's just acknowledging that, that you, need, you need someone to help you get back in the water again. Back in. Just keep swimming. Amen.